Melania, thank you, Center for Fiction. Thank you, Penguin. Um, look at this gorgeous book that just got reissued. Um, it has been such a joy to think about Shirley Hazard. Uh, I was telling all the other panelists in the green room-ish uh, that my love for her threatens to render me inarticulate, like the, the boat in the Suez Canal. <laughs> so I'm so glad they're, they're going to come on and, and speak to you a little bit uh, about the transit of Venus, about Shirley Hazard. Just because I know from social media that some of you have not yet read the book, um, I will give a very brief overview of who Shirley Hazard is, um, what the book is, and then we have a beautiful treat for you. Uh, so first, Shirley Hazard uh, is an Australian writer. Uh, she dropped out of school at 16 to move to Hong Kong with her parents uh, and then started working in, um, in diplomacy. And she worked for the UN for quite a long time. Uh, she lived in New York. She lived in uh, Sicily. Um, she married a wonderful biographer of Flaubert and Guy de Maupassant named Francis Stieg Mueller. And she is just this autodidactic, brilliant writer of many, many books, not only The Transit of Venus, also uh, which won the um, National Book Critics Circle Award, but The Great Fire, which won um, the uh, National Book Award, The Bay of Noon, The Evening of the Holiday, uh, People in Glass Houses, and a story collection. All of her books are brilliant in wildly different ways, so I would recommend everything. And The Transit of Venus, um, is, is I think her masterpiece, and I would like to ask this of my fellow panelists um, when they come on, but I'm going to describe it to you in her own words. Bernard Schwartz, who is a wonderful man who um, is in charge of the 92nd Street Y, sent along this beautiful uh, thing that people fill out when their books are about to be published. This is in Shirley Hazard's own typewriting. It's a request for biographical information. And shockingly, it's very poorly typewritten. Who would have thought that Shirley Hazard was a bad typewriter? Um, but she says of Transit of Venus that it is a novel about time, love, and the coming around of inexorable events. Within these larger themes, the acceleration and dislocation of modern life, the characters being divided in some cases within, within themselves between what is long, inevitable, and constant, and what is profitable, tangible, and incomplete, each consequently fulfilling his or her destiny. So very abstract. It is a gorgeous book of love and fate and destiny, uh, it's magical. So what we're about to hear is also courtesy of the 92nd Street Y. It is a clip of Shirley Hazard reading her own work. Um, in, and it's very important that you hear it in her own voice. So Melanie, uh, everyone, please take it away. In the previous year, Christian Thrale, who was then in his 20s, unexpectedly had an evening free from weekend work at a government office. In retrospect, it seemed to have been an evening free also of himself. He did not often go alone to a concert or anything else of the cultural kind. On your own, you were at the mercy of your responses. Accompanied, on the other hand, you remained in control, made assertive size, and imposed hypothetical requirements. You could also deliver your opinion, seldom quite favorable, while walking home. As to pleasure, he was suspicious of anything that relieved his feelings. The concert on that particular evening was furthermore too easy to get into. Yet passing in light rain, he saw posters and bought a seat on the aisle. He was scarcely in place when he had to stand again to let two women into the row. He lifted the folded Macintosh, the hat and damp umbrella he had dumped on the empty seat alongside. And the younger woman, having stood back for the elder, now sat there. He had noticed her large-eyed good looks at once when she glanced up, saying, sorry. But as the struggling out of coats went on and the drawing off of stubborn gloves, he lost interest. It was the other woman he next became aware of. The older woman was small and dark and wore a red felt circlet on her head, trimmed with navy ribbon. Around her shoulders, there was looped a swag of sharp little furs. The mouth of one fur fastened peg-like and with needle teeth on the paw of the other. In her lap, a handbag was crammed squat, and she dried this with rustling paper. 
that she was in some way related to the girl, though not of an age to be her mother, was evident from their manner together. It was hard to summarize, even in guesses, even in his mind, the relation of girl to woman, until as the musicians started to appear and more arrivals pushed along the rows, the phrase came to him, she is in her power. The older woman had been coaxed for an outing in the desperation of an interminable Sunday. That she expected nothing of the music was apparent from her turning this way and that, providing her own discordant tuning up. How people rig themselves out, will you just look at that one? I ask you. They might have done the place up a bit by now, don't you think? They mean to use the war as an excuse forever. The girl sat quietly, an evasion she would not be allowed to get away with. You're cheery, I must say. First you tell me I'm depressed, and then you don't have a solitary word to say for yourself. Now that he knew the association was founded in fear, he still wondered whether they were cousins, perhaps, or aunt and niece. When she turned his way, the wide high slope of the little woman's bright cheeks recalled the girl's. Not a breath of air in here. She flapped the furs on her breast and the pronged fox face snapped up and down. That's the way you catch things. Remind me to gargle when we get home. The lights lowered. Throughout the first work, Christian was aware of the woman simmering there, a boiling turned low. The girl between them was impassive, hands lightly clasped, slim knees aligned under dark skirt. At the interval, the little woman, murmuring to the girl, got up and went out to the ladies. She was no sooner down the aisle than Christian spoke. He had never done such a thing in life, but knew there was no time to lose. They got swiftly through some piffle about Sibelius, and by the time the duenna returned, Christian had written a phone number and suggested Saturday. All this, which should have seemed extraordinary to him, appeared inevitable and entirely right. He got to his feet, and Grace said, Dora, this is Mr. Thrale. He saw Dora's face flash with the realization they had stolen a march on her and with an impulse to spoil things. Dora saw a sandy man, quite tall, who could easily present a threat. Christian had discovered they were half-sisters and from Australia. When the concert was over, he put them in a cab. He did not, during that week, tell himself, I must have been besotted, even though besotted was one of his words. He knew that something out of the ordinary had been set in motion, but did wonder if it would survive reunion with Grace, whose attraction could well decline at an address of furnished rooms. One would then be faced with the process of coming to one's senses. To do him justice, Christian Thrale feared rather than hoped for this. All right, thank you. So the first question that I'm going to have is for the brilliant Stacy Schiff, who uh, I think everyone who's listening to this call should actually look up 92nd Y Org uh, archives, uh, look up Stacy Schiff and Shirley Hazard, because uh, to accompany this reading, you wrote this very brilliant essay, which I'm going to quote back at you, Stacy. My apologies. Um, but you have so many wonderful thoughts about this book, about the work. Uh, but I would like to ask first that you talk about what you you speak about so so wonderfully about Hazard's extraordinarily the extraordinary depth of knowledge that she if that flashes in and out of the text. You say in your essay, everywhere the erudition shimmers through the prose. It does so like a demure decorous spice. You may only dimly register its presence. You may mistake it for something else. But even if the name eludes you, Caraway Cumin, the effect is incalculable. So talk to me about what you see in this book, the refracted brilliance of Shirley Hazard. Um, and thank you for the sweet, for the sweet lead-in. Um, that's what strikes me as so impossible with this novel, that it is immensely erudite. I mean, she couldn't breathe without sounding erudite. And yet it's hysterically funny. And some of the erudition is the, back, the backdrop of the literature that she's able to weave through the book, but so much of it is the genius about human nature. And a lot of that comes out in the piece that we just heard. I mean, that just the character of, character of Dora, who by the way, is just a walking punching bag. I mean, she's heaven. Um, and and this, there's a sprightliness at the same, it's a sprightly Greek drama. Those are two things that don't generally go well together. And I think part of what thrills me about that reading, and I'm so glad you played that clip, 
is the delight that she seems to take, how, how sparkling, I mean, she, she's clearly completely in, 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 completely in love with her own sense of humor, right? Um, and there's so much of that that just comes out. At one point, at the end of that reading, there's a Q&A, and I think someone challenges her about how many lives are lost in the course of the novel. And she basically says, you know, it takes place over 50 years. I mean, I actually sort of thought that was a low body count. <laughs> It's hysterical. Anyway, I'll let someone else gush, but, but it, it's just this interplay of the immensely well-observed and epigrammatically expressed um, and the truly hilarious moment and line. Absolutely. You have this uh, other quote by uh, um, a critic called uh, John Russell in it, uh, which characterizes Shirley Hazard as if a highly intelligent and principled moth were able to talk, that's what she would sound like, which is so funny, right? It's sort of a little bit, powdery, but very, if it's a fritillary in a certain way, it sort of flies off very lightly and loosely. That's very, very beautiful. You know, when, when she came out that night from the wing, she had heard a, a subsequent event being advertised and she had heard the word flamboyant and she, it was actually an advertisement for Norman Mailer of all people. And she thought it was referring to her event and she kind of panicked a little bit. And when she got out on stage, she said, I'll try to be as flamboyant as possible, which now that we've seen her in action does seem, you know, kind of preposterous. That's hilarious. Uh, Min, I think of the people here, and, and forgive me if I'm wrong, and actually chime in if I am wrong, I think that you may be the only one who actually ever met Shirley Hazard in person. Is this correct, other panelists? I did. Oh, you did, Jeff. Okay, well, you're gonna have to tell us your story later. <laughs> Min, what is your story about? Oh. Yeah, I'm happy to dish about a writer that I met. It's really, <laughs> you know, we're at a literary event. We got to bring a little gossip. So I think before I published my first novel, I got into a 92nd Street master class that she had. So you had to, in order to get into the class, you had to, you know, submit some sort of manuscript. And I had submitted a very, very, very early and dreadful version of Pachinko, which was called something else back then. You know, like you, you're allowed to put in like five or 10 pages and she read through the pile of manuscripts and she selected you. And it was a four hour class. So, you know, all of her wisdom would somehow, you know, like pass through you. <laughs> in four, I know, in four hours. So I don't know what to do. I get into the class and I'm so excited. And there's all of us kind of like at her feet and she's wearing her one of her little like woolen caps or something, just looking as elegant as a human per you know, person can be. And then she says, she sits down and she said, I can't teach you how to write. <laughs> she was, you know, she's that school of writer that just kind of goes like, it can't be taught. I don't know why I took $90, but here you are. <laughs> what am I to do? So then we just kind of just like, and then she has a kind of a parcel of all of our manuscripts in her hot little hands. And at least you know that somehow you think Shirley Hazard may have looked at your prose and how exciting is that? Um, and the thing that I really remember, and I want to share this because as a woman, I thought this was like really quite remarkable. She said that when the dishwasher breaks, it is she who took care of the um, uh, repairing the machine because in her family, she was not the writer, it was Francis. And that was one of the anecdotes that she told and when I can think of very few women in the world who, who are kind of like modern 20th century comparisons to a George Eliot, it's really Shirley Hazard. And of course, for her to say that, I kind of thought she, you know, she d deals with the dishwasher repair. <laughs> okay, I'll have to just accept that. So that was really interesting. The, the fact that she felt like you can't teach writing and she also felt like she was the housewife. Like it just goes on paper plates, but yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jeff, you have to tell your story. Is it a story or is it an anecdote or you know, whatever? It's uh, <laughs> all I ever have is anecdotes. But uh, <laughs> after many years of failing to read uh, The Transit of Venus, which is, I think, not an uncommon thing. It's uh, this book that we've all ended up being utterly entranced by can be quite reader resistant at the outset. So I think I only got to grips with it um, after about, I think maybe 18 years after I bought it and after several aborted attempts. And I finally got round to reading it in 2004 because uh, if I remember rightly, that's when The Great Fire was published. And I mentioned this story just because it, it seems rather Hazardian as it were, 
So we had, um, it was uh, one of the finalists for the Orange Prize in London. And we had tea that day and because we had the same publisher and she was guaranteed to win. There was no doubt about it because incredibly, unbelievably, and you know the way that she says people accuse her books of being too reliant on coincidence, whereas she actually says there's loads more coincidence in the world than we would ever give credit for. Um, anyway, so there it is. It's the night of the prize. It's the transit of Venus. And yeah, um, Andrea Levy won for Small World. <laughs> Another wonderful book. I love that book. But um, I actually wanted to ask you, because you are the only person from the UK here, and uh, she, this book is set in England, um, for the most part. There, there are parts that happen in New York. Uh, and you said something extraordinary in your, your email about how she does, as an Australian, she does class in England in a way that Americans would not be able to. Could you address that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, there's, I mean, there are a couple of things, I think. First of all, I mean, I think we can, uh, there's that shared experience, I think, of the First World War, which is very, very important and which, uh, you know, it crops up again and again in the book. And it's really, of course, we expect there to be memorials to the First World War in Britain and France, but it's really remarkable if you go all across the world to Australia, there are memorials there everywhere. So I think there's that, there's that thing that's so important. She captures, I think, also the grimness of Britain, the poverty of Britain in the, those years after the Second World War. And yes, she does this thing, which is always such a test of anyone who's not English uh, when they're writing about England, this, this kind of thing of, uh, of class. And what I think one of the, I mean, the, the book is full of wonderful things, but she gets all the nuances of the class antagonism between uh, Tice and, uh, and Paul, whereby for no real reason, I mean, there's, there, there comes to be that kind of huge sort of sexual rivalry between them, but there's this radioactive class antagonism, which she just gets so precisely right. And it, it happens uh, as well in various other situations, but that's the, the central one. And when you're, uh, when, you're, when you're British and watching a film, uh, with somebody, uh, you know, playing that you, you're very, very sensitive to, to this kind of things. It's so easy to get it wrong. And she absolutely nails it as she does everything else. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Um, and a lot of the, the class issues manifest in character, of course, as, as almost everything in this book does. And Lisa, you were, you were transfixed by characters, right? The, the characters of the book in the way that you said, um, Hazard was daringly snarky about what it means to be a woman, which I found <laughs> funny. What did you mean by that? And, and how do you see the characters sort of speaking to you in your own personal reading? Um, I thought Dora was amazing. <laughs> um, because I think you'd almost have to know a Dora to write Dora so well. And knowing parts of Dora myself, I found it such a solace to read about the character so well done. And I found her, I mean, obviously she's a punching bag, it's true. But she's also, I mean, she was the only one that took them in, you know? So there's this, um, and then, uh, and then I think there's, this, so there's this quality of Caroline Bell where she, um, where she is her, she's kind of illegitimate in this culture. She's an orphan, she's Australian, talk about class. And, but she has this sovereign power, right? And there's this quality where whatever comes at her that's dishonest gets a little bit warped by her insistence on integrity and honesty. And is it a feminine quality? I don't know, but I felt, I mean, maybe it's like, um, Shirley Hazard talking about fixing the dishwasher or something like that, where I found it, I found something about Caro's sovereign power to have a feminine quality. And also when, when I was reading the, so, well, I mean, to interrupt myself, I think I didn't read it for a while also because the title and Shirley Hazard's name seemed so feminine in this kind of mushy way. You know, I'm from California. Maybe I just felt like it was gonna be some sort of astrological, um, 
book, I don't know, something about the title turned me off because it felt so feminine. But then I was thinking that the language too, which is so um, like driving and um, pinpointed and curt and, you know, sharp, that also, also has that quality where it warps whatever dishonesty is coming at it. I felt, I mean, toward the end of writing my own book, it was like the only book I could read. <laughs> I was like, because I would read a little bit of it and then I could think, okay, I can handle this. I can get back to being honest or something. And then there was something else that I found feminine, which was, so so at the end, you know, toward the end when, when Carol gets married and she's kind of rescued in a certain way or her life turns out okay. And she's like exhausted. She's resting all the time. Um, did I read into that too much? <laughs> but I just felt this quality of like creative and maybe feminine energy is not inexhaustible. It is not, I felt uh, like she was very powerful, but it had, a, it had its limit. And she kind of made it to the end of this struggle, which was kind of like this feminine struggle, like taking care of this person, taking care of this person, falling in love with the wrong person. And then she was exhausted in this kind of way that I found very relatable. So, and I'm a single child of a single mother and, and, and my mother and I are kind of locked in this um, survival uh, uh, guilt and uh, struggle, you know, I'm making it sound horrible. It's also good, but I could identify, I think with the, with the quality of, of their dependence and also difficulty with Dora. Not that my mother's Dora, but I found those characters so beautifully rendered. Well, you, um, Shirley Hazard actually admitted in an interview that she had based Dora on her own mother, but she had actually tempered her a little bit. I think the mother was much worse than Dora is, and Dora's hilarious. Um, but I'm so glad you were talking about the language, too, because we're going to have Meg Wolitzer. Hi, Meg. Do Hi. a small reading and then tell us what you think about the language, about the... Absolutely. Uh, okay, let me find this. Okay. In the government office where Caroline Bell worked, there was a young woman called Valda. That she was called Valda was to the point, for she objected to this. None of the other women there objected to being Millie, Pam, or Miranda, with their appointed Mr. Smedley's and Mr. Renshaw Browns. None of the other women objected, for that matter, to being girls. By that epoch, the men themselves were no longer Bates or Barkham to one another, but instantly Sam or Jim. Those who had irreducibly formal names such as Giles or Julian even seemed to be lagging dangerously and doomed to obscurity. There was one older man in planning who would say Mr. to his subordinates, Mr. Haynes, Mr. Dandridge, like the skipper of an old ship with his first mate or bosun. But he too among the women permitted himself an occasional Marge or Marigold, although at home calling his charwoman Mrs. Dodds. When Caro asked, if they make a true friend, what will they call him? Valda told her, they're hoping to put true friendship out of business. New compulsory congeniality among males was at least, however, in Valda's view, a loss equally shared, unlike the outright seizure of June or Judy. Soon after her, June or July, soon after her arrival, Valda had drawn attention to herself. Her little Mr. Ledbetter, the administrative officer, had come out of his hutch ears up holding a button and asked her if she would show it on, sew it on. This, he estimated, would not take a minute. Valda politely consented, and laying aside her papers, brought from a desk drawer a housewifely pouch of needles and colored threads. With Mr. Ledbetter's jacket a swoon in her lap, she narrowed her own eye to the needles and was soon stitching. Ledbetter stood to watch her. His shirt was striped and blue. His trousers came to his armpits, depending from canvas braces, also striped, that had long ago been made to last. It was pleasant to doff his armor and watch the handsome Valda at her humble and womanly task. When she had done, when she had wound the thread and broken it off, he was grateful. Thank you, Valda. I am not handy with such things and would jab myself to pieces. It was important to show appreciation. To this, Valda replied, echoing his own benevolent thoughts. These are small things to do for one another. The following week, Valda came into his office where he was reading over a penultimate draft and asked him to change her typewriter ribbon. Mr. Ledbetter stared. She said, I am not handy with machines. He was baffled and displeased. 
Have you never needed a new ribbon before? Were you not trained to do these things? It will not take a minute. You'd better get one of the girls to show you. It was incomprehensible. They will dirty their hands. She said, it is a small thing to do. Now he understood. He went out and got one of the other girls, the real girls, in a rage. Miss Fenchurch needs help with her machine. It was the first time he had not called her Valda, but respect was accorded only from peak. The second girl looked with ingratiating timidity at him and with terror at Valda, and at once bent to the machine as if over a cradle. When the time came, Mr. Ledbetter wrote in Valda's file that she tended to be aggressive over trifles. Tended was official code for going the whole hog. So that's the little section I chose. <laughs> Why'd you choose the section, Meg? Well, I think that's a real little feminist moment. And I thought it was really kind of interesting. And I, you know, the book, um, the book is dedicated to or acknowledged at the beginning, um, E. M. Burbage, uh, the astronomer, E. Margaret Burbage, who is a quite famous and accomplished world famous astronomer and whose husband was Jeffrey Burbage, a huge lion of a figure in astronomy as well. And I guess I would say that Margaret probably was the less celebrated of the two. Um, I, well, I don't, you know, now I'll probably hear from people saying that isn't true. But as, well, I, what I would say, I'll, I'll amend that. Astronomy, you know, was such a male field uh, and she, you know, sought her out and I don't know what their relationship was, but uh, that was interesting to me. And I have not looked into it, but you know, how she knew her or, you know, came to her for uh, advice on the astronomy in the book. But I felt that, you know, the book has these incredible women characters. I mean, to go around to that, it has these strong or strongly rendered women characters. And I think the thing that is strongest about this book itself and of Hazard as a writer herself is style, which is a word that I don't like because it seems like we're talking about the cut of a dress, but we're not. Um, the style in this book is powerful and powerfully what it is. I don't see it as male or female. I don't see it as, I see it as, um, she is doing the thing that Zadie Smith said, some, a wonderful line in an essay, um, uh, the story of Clive, I guess she talks about, when I write, I'm trying to show my way of being in the world. I feel that Hazard, who, and when, when I first heard of this book, when it came out and I was in college, I called her Shirley Hazard. <laughs> I just, I didn't know. I'd never heard it said aloud. I had no idea. Shirley Hazard. It sounded so sophisticated. Um, um, I think she is writing her way of being in the world. You know, you described her accurately as an autodidact. This comes from what? I mean, the incredible erudition. Absolutely, Stacey's, of course, so right. But married to that is this sense of how she sees the world, the things that are worth focusing on. And I guess that's what style is. Like, where do you land? Where does your attention land? And I was just becoming a writer when I read this book. And I saw the way the style was so fully embossed upon the page. And it's sort of like that thing that happens if you read a writer um, without their name on it, you know who it is. And I love that. Like, how would you know? How would you know you would recognize your child's face across the playground? You would recognize a Shirley Hazard line. And I think, Lauren, you said in your, um, in your introduction something about the lines landing on this certain word, right? Did you say something like that? Like landing hard on a word and that's the, the strongest, like a sledgehammer that's uh, a beautiful sledgehammer somehow. I, I just, the language, but it's not just the language, it's the style. Love that. So panel as a whole, how would you address Shirley Hazard's style? Because I would agree, Meg, it is the quality of, of attention, right? It's also the, the kind of language, but how does she create the style that she does in this book? That's, that's uh, unlike anything else that I actually know. Um, tell me, take it away. Well, you know, in that passage that Meg just, Meg just read there is that hilarious thing about him led better. First of all, the names. Can we just stop for a second? Oh. oh my God, what genius for naming characters, right? And 
Ledbetter comes out and with his of his hutch with his ears up. Yeah. She slides that in there. She's so sly. She just slips that in there um, so easily, right? But it's almost as if there's a there's an epigram every you know half page or so. But in the midst of that is that dialogue that, and I think Lauren, you nailed it completely when you talked about how the dialogue, it's clumsy sounding, but it somehow works. It lands with a thump in some way. It's very awkward. Mm -hmm. There are those weird syncopated lines about, you know, as he reached for the biscuit, she leaned in as if. They kind of go, they trail along and it, it's somehow no one else writes, no one else could write these lines. It's exactly what Meg says about a signature. It's muscular in some way. Well, you know, the names, it's so funny because most of the names have are one syllable, the last names. And I just was sort of writing some of them down, uh, you know, uh, Sefton Thrail oh. and Christian Thrail, uh, Cordelia Ware, Angus Dance, Adam Tertia. Vale, Tertia Drage, which sounds like a bunch of letters that somebody just sort of put together and, you know, rearranged in a funny way. Like, the, I can't believe I'm even mentioning this person in the same breath. But, um, Ayn Rand, those names like Howard Rourke and John Galt. This is the opposite though. Those are done because she really, like in a cartoonish, you know, way. But these are done, it's as if they're an etching. It's like digging the etching tool in very, very hard. And Tertia Drage, like that's nervy to come up with a name like that, that just doesn't sound like a name and couldn't be in any other book, but I will always remember it in this one. I Jeff, you said, um, sorry, you were speaking, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I was just going to say about this, the style. I mean, uh, on the, it, yes, it, it, it's poetic, but there's never anything, let's say, flowery about it unless she's describing sort of plants and flowers. And it seems to me that there's always every, every sentence is a kind of unit of narrative propulsion, and it's got all of this exactness and sparkle in it but there's also so much tension in it and I mean just to, at one point I think it's Adam Vale who talk, who's talking to Caro and he says some paintings transmit the suspense of life itself and of course in fiction quite often we think of suspense has, having to do with plot and thrillers but it seems to me there's always so much suspense in a Shirley Hazard sentence. And let me give you an example of what I, you know, it was my one ambition in this course was in this uh, call was to be able to say to you all at some point, allow me to refresh your memory. Please do, <laughs> please. <laughs> Which, uh, and you know why I've said that. Um, anyway, it's this, uh, it's this bit, uh, it's early on. Caro said, I don't like and took a cream wafer. Peak freen, she read, before biting the lettering in half. <laughs> there's an enormous amount going on in that, isn't there? You know, there's action, there's tension, and all she's doing is biting this biscuit, which um, I'm certainly very familiar with from, uh, from my childhood. Anyway, now that I've been able to, to, to quote what's-his-name, <laughs> saying that, that great moment when he says, uh, when she birth, you know, uh, when... Um, uh, yeah, what's his name says, allow me to refresh your memory. And it's you know, a few pages later, she bursts into tears and can't work out what's going on. And she just says, will you promise me never to say anything like that again? He says, what? And she says, allow me to fresh your, refresh your memory. <laughs> but that's also something that, I mean, something that's so unique with this book is the temporal braiding. So many things come up and then don't get, I mean, Adam Vale, one of our major characters appears and doesn't really make his entrance until hundred pages later. Someone will ask for the etymology of a word early on in the novel and it turns up with another character's conversation much later. I mean, just, it's so, and, and you're, you're in on the joke. I mean, just refreshing your memory. I mean, those lines that people are allergic to, which then other characters have, have to, of course, enunciate. And it's, the mustard getting past three pages after someone asks for it. I, it's just, it's just the brilliant sense of pacing, which I can't, I mean, I can't think of another novel, even the side of Nabokov, that's that intricate in its plotting. I think what it does is it creates almost a membrane around the novel, as if this is a world that is enclosed, where this mustard is here and then there. And she creates the kind of closure, whereas I feel sometimes when novels that, that aren't as sort of 
tightly constructed is this beautifully like with the joints all really in place you feel in a sense a kind of openness which can be freeing too i'm not saying that this is the only way to write a novel at all but the enclosure is very powerful and very safe feeling all at once like i'm going to keep i know i will if she drops something she will pick it up you know there's that kind of feeling. you feel you can completely relax because she knows what she's doing yeah. yes it's musical. It's it's like a fugue, right? She she'll she'll um, send in an idea and then she'll spin it a little bit halfway through, and it does create this this um, feeling of largeness and smallness at the same time because it's all about particularities, mm -hmm. right? And and she works in multiple temporal modes. Um, she she does. This is a very epic book in a lot of ways, and yet it's also extraordinarily specific in some in some ways. I like that. She, oh, sorry. Oh, please, Matt, go, go ahead. I was just going to say what I one of when you mentioned that I was like nodding along, of course, like a bobblehead here, because she she gives as much import to the quote small as to the large. She cares equally about both. It's not like she's biding her time until there can be a big event. She cares so much about what we might call domestic. And I feel that that's right. That's exactly right. She's not sort of showing her hand. She's, she's really, um, she cares about it. They both are, what, it matters what happens to people when no one else is looking and it matters what happens out in the world too. She doesn't condescend to people, I think, to the reader or to the details of the lives of her characters, but also not to the reader. It's so nice not to be condescended to. Yeah, do you feel, I wonder if, if here's a question. I mean, I feel, is it a book that absolutely insists that you read it well in order to read it at all? I mean, I felt that even though I read it relatively late in my life, I felt I emerged from it a much better reader of anything than I had before, even though that then, of course, manifested itself in a dissatisfaction with things that I might uh, previously have been reasonably happy with. Well, isn't there... Sorry. Oh, well, the thing that I want to go back to your question of style, because style is essentially the personality of the writer, right? So style is created by syntax and diction. And also it's all the technical choices that she makes as a fiction writer. So what we, we talked about the characterization, but the most important thing that reflects her style is her omniscience, which is point of view. And there's a kind of knowingness, but the knowingness is, and the trust that we think about this really knowing omniscient narrator is her care. And I loved, I loved the sentence that you wrote, Lauren. I want to go to this one sentence that you wrote. She said, you wrote, this is a book that treats its characters with tenderness as though to mitigate the pain that will be inflicted upon them by time. What is so brilliant about this sentence is that I really think it encapsulates the good, the kind, the trustworthy, omniscient narrator. And that is a point of view that is so rarely used by 20th and 21st century authors and when I was studying omniscient narrators, I really turned to Hazard because she had that sort of scope and she could do the, the micro as well as the macro. And then she also had the global. She had this kind of real cosmopolitan sense. And I think it does reflect in every single word that she chooses, her diction and the arrangement of her sentences. And I, I can think of very few writers who have that kind of elegance that kind of intelligence and elegance. And also she's not sexist. And, yeah. and I say that really intentionally because there's a lot of 19th century women writers who are a little sexist, a little self-hating. And I think in here, it's not present. And it's such a delightful thing to see. Yeah, I just mm. found an example of, of that wonderful sense of omniscience, but also the characters speaking. She has a line, um, neither of them had forgotten the nursing home, the television screen, how Charmian Frail had said, they are already dead of those who had lost track of their own absurdity. So that last bit, those who had lost track of their own absurdity is not dialogue, but it's just, it, it's packed into the sentence to explain it and help us see what that line meant. And to your point really about true. not being sexist, there's such a sense of the greater world. I mean, there is such a, an echo of the war with almost every character. I mean, I think I forget that every time, I, I, every time I go back to it, I'm struck anew by how much of the, of the global, events actually have formed and have come to bruise in some way most of these characters. 
Um, and that's, that's, I think that's why I say muscular, because on the one hand it, hand, it is a very intimate novel and a very epic novel, but there's also just this sense of perspective, which is so rare. She slides in and out, right? She slides from the, the, the very precise, very personal to the elevated. And there's this, this, this part that she, she writes about. She says, on the old world, history lay like a paralysis. In France, the generals died. In Italy, a population abandoned the fields forever to make cars or cardigans in factories. And economists called this a miracle. And so like, that is her being like George Eliot, like as, as Stacey said earlier, way out here seeing the whole field at play. And then she'll go straight into someone's consciousness um, and just pinpoint just with extraordinary um, precision, right? She's, she's able to do this moder modulation in tones throughout the book, which, which keeps you spinning. Like Jeff said, it's, it's, it's what propels you through the book, right? Because if you actually look at the scenes, not much is happening in the scenes, actually. Right? There are people sitting around talking a lot. Um, and yet, it's just extraordinarily uh, propulsive. It's, it's, it, it feels as though we're, we're going through time at breakneck speed um, because we have this duplicity of vision, right? We have, not duplicity, sorry, duality of, of vision. We, we have um, the opposite of duplicity. We have, um, we have the, the grand and, and, and the, the micro at the same time. I'm afraid we have to open it to questions, but I wanna keep this conversation going. So um, let me open it to questions. Melanie, I'm going to take them unless you want to. Yes? Please go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So, wait a second. Um, I'm so sorry. Okay. Julie says some chapters could stand alone, such as when Christian Thrail dips his tepid toe into adultery. Do any of you know if they were published alone in the New Yorker, perhaps? And yes, they were. There were a couple of them that were published in the New Yorker, and you can you can actually find them um, if you have a New Yorker subscription. Uh, she published a great deal in the New Yorker. Uh, a lot of the stories in her story collection did. Um, so, so Erica says peat creams are a very serious cookie. I don't know what peat creams are. Great. Biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Susan Lipman asks. If one reads books to feel and then think, what does one feel upon reading this book and what does one think about it? Was that for me? Sure. No, I'm, I, oh gosh. Meg, I think you have a thinking face on. Oh, no, that was just, I'm happy to. Yeah, please go ahead, yes. <laughs> um, I yield my time, yes. <laughs> no, 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 please, I insist. <laughs> um, if it's you, one of these you, live grenade questions that everyone is passing on to everyone else. Yeah. Right? <laughs> can, can we hear it? Can you repeat the question? Yeah. If one reads books to feel and then think, what does one feel upon reading this book and one, what does one think about it? Okay, well, yeah, I think I do have a response to that in that, you know, we could easily between between us draw up a list of you know hundred great novels published since the Second World War, let's say. But I can think of few other novels where I feel that there's so much history of the novel rolled up in into a novel, and it's a particular sort of strain in the novel, which I think is that sort of story of I don't know the kind of excess uh, uh, an excess of female consciousness which is denied by circumstances. And we can take that back to it's, you know, let's say that the sort of archetypal figure of that is Dorothea Brooke in, in, in Middlemarch. And then we move forward and we, we remember, of course, that Lawrence first intended Women in Love and the Rainbow to be a single book called The Sisters. So I feel that there is that thing there of these people, of these two sisters coming into consciousness. Hardy is all over this book. And then, of course, I mean, not surprisingly, you know, uh, Madame Bovary is there, give, not, not surprisingly at all. But I think also then, crucially, although she said he wasn't such an influence, I think Henry James is there in quite an interesting way with Australia uh, playing the role of, that America did for Henry James. I, that is to say, they come from this new, let's say, somewhat uncivilized country to Britain. But in this case, it's... Um, it's Australia. So there is so much of the, um, 
of the, the history of the novel, which is rolled up in, 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 into, into this one. That would be, I can't think of another novel that, that, uh, a, that does so much of that rolling up of the tradition into itself. Jeff, in the scene that Meg read, isn't that just a salute, a, fo a full scale salute to Forster? I mean, how many people forget umbrellas in concert halls, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, oh. just the one that she read herself. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, Jeff, it's so interesting what you said, Jeff, because I hadn't really thought of it as directly as you did. But what I, what I felt reading the book was how pleasurable it was to return to it. And it reminded me of reading experiences of the past, the mm -hmm. pleasure of a powerful novel, of, a, of the authority, of the authority of a writer who chooses to go here or there. And the choices that he or she makes, in this case, that she makes, feel absolutely right. But you're right that the echoes, the, it's all there without the anxiety of influence. It's all there very strongly. And our pleasure at, at a lifetime of reading kind of comes out in reading this book. This actually, it, this all ties into another question that um, um, Tamara asked, which is hearing Jeff speak of Shirley Hazard's sentences put her in mind of Proust. Do you think that she was influenced by Marcel Proust? Um, I have, I just reread um, Auto de um, and I have a hard time seeing the influence, but I'm sure it's there, right? I um, the interiority and the 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 love of arts and the way that um, writing is um, the highest aesthetic. Um, endeavor one could could uh, go into, I, I, I'm I sure it's there. I have no proof. <laughs> what do you think? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm one of these people I've never been able to read Proust. You know, I just read a book and then I always think, oh, for God's sake, go and kick a ball around or something. Why don't you? <laughs> Is there a moment in the book where one of the women gets a Marcel wave in her hair? Because you know, <laughs> that would be a little wink. I think also, Jeff, you were saying something earlier about after you finished it, you felt like you needed to read differently other books. Oh, and I, I thought that too. I felt sort of slapped, like, oh. like um, you, uh, this is like is a totally new way of using the English language. Mm -hmm. And I, it was a little shocking and a little unsettling, but I wanted it to be part of my future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would love to ask the panelists this one question, if I could intercede, is that, do you think that this book can be read by most people today with the attention span that we have? Because this book demands your concentration. I was thinking about like, how would I assign this book to my students? Like how much time would I give to my students to read this novel? Would they get mad at me? <laughs> I'm just wondering, what, what do you guys think? <laughs> because I want their approval. So. <laughs> actually don't believe that we have shortened attention spans and I know that goes against everything that neuroscientists believe right? okay. <laughs> and everyone in pop culture believes but I actually personally my attention span is um growing longer just because I'm so tired of the world and all I want to do is read and and pandemic yeah. brain has slowed me down to the extent where um, in the past, you know, I probably would be more ADHD and now I just want to get deep into things. But that's just me. Um, and who knows what other people feel? I don't know. All right, panel, what do you think? Well, I feel as if it works on so many levels. You know, you could read this book superficially as a love story. Right. And you could probably just thoroughly overlook the way the pieces lock together. Um, you could probably overlook half the foreshadowings and the repetitions and the, you know, the, the things that we, that we probably find most gratifying about it because we were so, we're so perhaps overly familiar with it. But it, it works on so many levels, I feel like it would be very appealing, you know, even just at a first read. I think there's a great line of Francis Stigmuller's, isn't there, where he says he feels sorry for whoever has to read Transit for the first time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why do you why do you think you feel sorry though? I feel I feel happy I, for someone. I reading. feel jealous. I feel jealous too, but I think because you miss so much on on the first yeah. read. I mean, yeah. I'm still finding things in this book. It actually requires a really close read to even understand what what what's happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't be like one of those sort of readers who sees I you know well in this case there isn't italics, but 
you know, italics, and then you just sort of think, well, it can't be that important because they used italics and you miss the whole thing. Like the beginning of A Passage to India, right? There's a whole italicized section and you'd have to read it. Um, you have to be a close reader. And I feel that there's something so encouraging and heartening about people who want to be close readers and about in this time, particularly. It, it is a, it's a, it runs counter. It, it's, I agree with you, Lauren. I don't know that it's about attention, but it is about a fast pace of the world. Like the novel requires that things slow down. It's like a psychoanalysis as opposed to, you know, giving somebody medication. It's like, it requires a slowing down of how we process everything. And then going back and looking at that line and circling it and saying, did I read that right? Did I understand that? And it requires that we give that time to it, that we say that that's worth it. Like a new cadence, right? Yeah. You have to have a new cadence. I yeah. think your students would love it. There's a real sexiness to it. And it's about young people. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. sexy novel, totally. Yeah. Yeah. With, yeah. I mean, even if you do read it as just a love story, it's a fast story. And yeah, it's very and short. It's, it's actually not short, but it's it moves. It feels short, it feels really short, doesn't it? I mean, well, it goes fast. Once you get into those love stories, it, once you get into that, it, it moves really at it quick. 50, yeah. But, it's and it proves 50 years, right? So she has to spin fairly quickly. It's 70 years per decade or 70 pages per decade. That's, that's not much time to linger. So I think you should teach them transitive Venus. <laughs> also, I think that it's a really wonderful book if you want to be a writer. Yes. I do think it's something that you should study carefully like several times in order to be a writer. To have that kind of control over everything. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing about time, who doesn't like a book that follows over time? It's so moving. Margaret Atwood had that line, she was maybe half joking. She said that novels are about time and poetry is about eternity. Um, mm -hmm. This really is, she said it herself, at, you know, at the beginning what we heard, but this is about time. And to me, there's nothing more satisfying than seeing how did it turn out at least the part that she gave her attention to. How did that, what, how did that all work out? So there are a lot of questions right now um, about the end and about the foreshadowing in the beginning. Um, so those of you who are nodding, uh, I think basically people are saying, well, what about it? Why did it happen? Why do you think that the, she, she did this? Why did she, she put it into the, um, the text and then explode it at the end? I don't want to ruin it for anybody who hasn't read this book yet, but there is a profound foreshadowing that happens. Um, and if you're not an attentive reader, you won't catch it. Um, or even if you're an attentive reader and you're not, you, you, I don't know, I don't, why, why did she do this? Why did she make this, 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 um, bury this Easter egg that then became a bomb? You know, I was thinking about Madame Bovary, because if you look at the first page of Madame Bovary, and of course she's living with um, Francis Stigmuller, you have a first person narrator in Madame Bovary, a, a boy who actually knew Emma's husband as a student. And it's really he who's telling the story in the omniscient narration. And I kept on thinking about that and this foreshadowing because 99.9% .9 of the people who read Madame Bovary miss this weird first person reference because he absolutely disappears. And I kept on thinking, was she thinking about that? <laughs> was she thinking about the fact that it, and also I was thinking about her age because she was, I think almost 50 when this book came out. So she had lived this humongous life. And then she had that sort of this authority, this confidence, this self-possession to tell the story. And she said, I know what happens now. I know what happens later on. And I can tell this in the way I want to. And that took guts. And I just, I don't know, like, again, her style is like, it's really snappy. It also is a novel about destiny. So you sort of need to plant the seed, right? For what's going to come to fruition on the last pages. Um, and I just do think, I mean, she was thinking about the reader's pleasure. What could be more pleasurable mm -hmm. than the resolution of a mystery that you only half recognize yeah. at least the first five times you read it, right? And it makes you feel very smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It makes you feel that reading a novel is, is going from a state of cloudiness to clarity. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was brilliant, Meg. That was very, that's true. I'm, I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> Note to self. 
<laughs> when writing novel. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Well, this is a, a linked question to this idea of destiny. Uh, Scott asks, why aren't novels written from the omniscient point of view these days? And I, I mean, they are, but a lot of novels are written from first person or very, very limited uh, omniscient. It takes longer. I only write an omniscient. It just takes so much longer for me to feel like I can tell that story because I am, first of all, there's the narrator, the omniscient narrator, and then you have a billion characters on this canvas. And I feel like I have to know everybody so freaking well in order to write it. And then you have the decisions of, are you going to be a moral narrator or not? Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of decisions that one has to make. And I think that with Hazard, she, she knows what she's talking about and it's wonderful to be in her presence. Mm -hmm. So, and you don't want to cheat that. And I do think that in a way, when you pick third person limited or third person and you go that deeply, that psychological pleasure is so seductive too. So, and first person, of course. And I, and I think that, um, and readers love that first person and third person limited because you want to go really, really, really deep and you can have that beautiful, um, journey with that one person and root for them whereas an omniscient you can have a coldness and i think that people don't like that coldness or that distance so it, it's the hardest decision don't you think as a novelist to yes, choose but i don't feel cold about your characters oh very my kind. god <laughs> very kind of i'm in love with them <laughs> but it's, i cried for all of them oh thank you uh, can but you it's harder TikTok because video? you have to be you a, make god. a tiktok video i could sell more books so <laughs> But it's harder because you're saying you have to be a kind of God that you can enter into all of, enter and exit all of them. Right. So I find them difficult to do, but I, I love them because it allows me to be everybody and to also try to understand your point of view. But, but it's yeah. still you're choosing who to be. So it's almost like a novelist is not, is like a, a God, but a lesser God, yeah. you know? Because mm -hmm. you're making those choices. Even omniscience excludes a lot of, points of view right. or, lingers, or lingers for a while in one that, that the writer finds important. Well, I mean, writers were all shoddy gods, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Even you guys, I mean, except you guys, of course. I mean, I feel. <laughs> I, mean, I think one of the reasons why omniscience is not chosen mm. all that often is because, you know, we're modern readers and we have, we have lived through postmodernism and we've lived through the sort of the idea of the scaffolding of the narrative and, and the artificiality of choosing a point of view and, and coming in and out. Also, probably because at least American culture has become more secular and this idea of sort of God passing in and out um, feels uncomfortable for a lot of people. Um, I think that that, uh, the resistance to the omniscient or to choosing the omniscient as a writer is a resistance to God um, in, in, in maybe a very real way. Um, but we are past our time, unfortunately. Melanie, I'm sorry that I, I was uh, not on the ball here. Um, I love talking to you all. I would talk to you for five more hours if I could. I am sorry, uh, I have to shut this down, but thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Such a wonderful discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Get the book. And yeah. buy your books from the Center for Fiction because they hosted us and it was uh, wonderful. <laughs> and this version has Lauren's introduction. Oh, we all have different editions, Jeff. Well, this is the new one. I have this is the old oh, one. I was glad oh, to and that's the, <laughs> I don't know. Jeff, what's yours? This is <laughs> You guys are the greatest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Show yours again. Me? Yeah. yeah, show yours, Jeff. What's your, what is that? Old, That's it? gorgeous. It took me 20 years to get around to reading it. Oh my. <laughs> yeah, she does have heavy hair. She's often described as having heavy hair. And there it is. Well, well actually, Carol has black hair, which is described right. as oriental, actually. Right. And I, I'm not canceling her, but. <laughs> a little dated, a little dated. <laughs> a little, but that's okay. But she's supposed to have black hair, which I always thought that was so strange when I met, you know, Shirley Hazard. I was like, you look like Grace, not like Carol. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we could do a whole other hour on the hair and the neck, though, don't you think? The neck. Yes. 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 <laughs> about the necks. <laughs> oh. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank all you. All Thank you. The audience for joining us. And we'll see you all again soon, I hope. Mm.